Welcome back. The Bronx has the highest incidence of asthma in the United States and was also an early COVID-19 epicenter. How were pediatric emergency department visits impacted during COVID-19? Joining us now to share more is Dr. Rachel Levine, a fellow at the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, or CHAM. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, let's get right into it. Um, doctor, can you first give us some background on this study pertaining to asthma and COVID-19? Sure. So when we learned that COVID-19 was a respiratory virus with a substantial effect on the breathing system, and knowing that respiratory viruses trigger asthma exacerbations, we were appropriately concerned about the children in the Bronx who suffer from asthma. And as you said, the Bronx has the highest incidence of asthma in the United States, and pediatric asthma in the Bronx is nearly twice that the national average. So because of all this, we anticipated a surge in presentations to our pediatric emergency department. Thank you, doctor, for that background. And what were some of your findings in the study? So contrary to what we thought with asthma, we actually found the opposite, that during, despite being located in an asthma hub, that during the pandemic, the relative percentage of asthma-related pediatric emergency department visits declined appreciably. Hmm. And also, in addition to our asthma findings, uh, we found that there was a substantial decrease in overall visits to the emergency department. But the children that did come in were much more sick and much more likely to be hospitalized than before the pandemic. And these findings we saw were sustained beyond the pandemic peak in April and May and lasted into the first two New York State phased reopenings, which brought us to about July 6, 2020. Wow. Um, thank you for sharing, doctor. And, um, you know, earlier today, we spoke about the environmental effects of highways like the Cross Bronx. Uh, doctor, what can you say about the relationship between infrastructure and childhood asthma here in the Bronx? So it's well known that, you know, there's a complex relationship between both genetics and outdoor and indoor environmental factors okay. in the development and exacerbation of asthma. Uh, among the environmental factors, those associated with inner city living, like the ones you just mentioned, highways and infrastructure, have been shown to contribute towards an asthma diagnosis. You know, in overall, environmental factors are multifactorial. There are many, but certainly poor air quality, in part, does contribute to asthma morbidity. Right. And I also wanted to share that a neighborhood in Mont Haven, as many of us know, in the South Bronx is referred to as Asthma Alley. What are some other factors and reasons behind disproportionate risk from air pollution and climate change in our borough? So, you know, our study uh, was not meant to evaluate factors behind the disproportionate risks from pollution and climate change that do very much exist in the Bronx. You know, but when it comes to Asthma Alley, health experts have long attributed the poor air quality to excessive roadways, densely packed toxic waste facilities, um, densely packed bus depots, overcrowding, just to name a few. And this is an area that definitely warrants further investigation. Right. Um, and doctor, you mentioned that uh, patient emergency department visits were lower during the pandemic. Uh, does your research suggest that less children visited pediatric emergency departments during COVID because they weren't exposed to harmful air pollutants? Is that what the study says? No, not necessarily. You know, our study was not able to evaluate the exact reason behind the decrease that we did see of children coming into the emergency department. And again, it is definitely multifactorial. There were school closures and social distancing measures, and all of these efforts ultimately decrease our exposure to different viruses that we know trigger asthma. In terms of pollution, like you mentioned, improved air quality in part because their traffic on the roads and in the air was reduced may have positively impacted asthmatics. Um, also, shelter-in-place orders were designed during the high pollen season in the spring of 2020, mm -hmm. and so that had to reduce allergy-induced asthma exacerbations that we usually see in the spring. Right. What does all of this mean for patients and doctors alike like yourself? So, you know, when managing a complex chronic disease like asthma, it really does take a community. The key is now to try and understand the reason behind the patterns that we observed in our study. So 
we can't change genetics. We can't change those components, but doctors and patients can work together towards modifying some of the infectious and environmental exposures that we do know trigger asthma. And can we talk a little bit about um, those uh, resources and services available to patients in the Bronx at CHAM, um, for instance, doctor, if you can share just some of those programs. Sure. So, you know, we do have asthma specialists at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. We have a pediatric asthma center. More information on that can be found at our website. Uh, that is www.cham.org. We also uh, can connect with uh, the community over our Twitter handle, which is at Montefiore Peds. Thank you. Um, can you also share what percentage of COVID-19 hospitalizations consisted of asthma patients at the height of the pandemic? Is that something that the study measured at all? No, our study did not specifically look at active COVID-19 infection in known asthmatic patients. Uh, many children with asthma were hospitalized for COVID. And while asthma has been described as a risk factor for developing more severe COVID-19 illness, asthma may or may not have had a role in their specific hospitalization. So you can't make that conclusion uh, right off of what we know now. Right. Um, what are we seeing now in your department, doctor? Are more patients coming in, you know, for preventative care? Are they more, um, you know, able to, I mean, confident in coming into the hospital? And I know a lot of folks during the height of the pandemic were really worried and concerned about, you know, safety at a hospital. Definitely. And rightfully so. I, I will say confidently people are, are returning back to the emergency department. Um, and I think a lot of the pandemic fear is starting to subside uh, you know, with all of the different measures and vaccination efforts that have been out there. But we are seeing a return back to what we once knew. As a fellow, what can you tell um, people in the Bronx about managing asthma and, you know, managing pediatric asthma in particular? So, you know, as I mentioned before, there are certain things that we can't control genetics um, in, in terms of getting involved with local governments and lobbying for infrastructure that, you know, is is it surrounds us with more healthy options um, so that we don't have our asthma exacerbated, we can do that. But for the day-to-day -day families, recognizing the efforts that social distancing had, such as mask wearing, frequent hand washing, and how that positively impacted asthmatics. We don't want people to feel restricted forever with social distancing measures, but keeping in mind the things that did work during the pandemic and trying to sustain those efforts moving forward. Right. And is there anything that we can do at home um, in regards to, you know, minimizing, minimizing the factors of asthma early on? So, in, yeah. So you can definitely try and improve your air quality in the home as much as possible. Um, that is hard when there's a lot of, you know, external forces working against us. But what you can do in your home is making sure you have humidification and purified air, trying to decrease the kinds of allergens that do exist in the home. A lot of that comes from different animal dander or smoke exposure. Anything you can do to limit that will certainly help. Uh, but certainly you should definitely consult a pediatric pulmonologist and an asthma specialist or an allergy and immunologist to discuss these uh, measures further. Thank you, Dr. Rachel Levine, for joining us today and speaking more about this topic. Um, before we go, how can people find out more about these studies and connect with CHAM? So on our website, you can go to www.cham.org and you can look up our pediatric asthma center and find an asthma specialist as well. You can find us on our Twitter handle. Uh, you do have an ongoing event going on, right, with the with the virtual presentation of these studies as well, which is where we found out about um, this specific one. Um, are they still happening? Are people able to to join in? So this study is actually uh, it, it was selected to be. Um, presented at a national pediatric conference called Pediatric Academic Society, which is how I believe you found out about it. We also have it showcased locally at our hospital. Um, and you can go to the website to find out more information about that. All righty. Doctor, I'm also curious to learn how you got to the Bronx. Um, why did you decide to, to you know, pursue uh, pediatric medicine? And, you know, what fuels you in continuing to, to aid our children here in the Bronx? Sure. I'm a, I'm a native New Yorker born and raised. I did my, I'm, so I'm a general pediatrician, board certified, and now I'm training as a pediatric emergency medicine specialist. I did my pediatric training and chief residency training in Brooklyn at SUNY Downstate and Kings County. And uh, from Brooklyn, I, I decided to move up to the Bronx. Um, 
I sort of am interested in, in going to different boroughs in New York. And that's how I wound up there. I've always been interested in pediatrics. Before that, I was a public school teacher in East Harlem. How has it been going for you during the pandemic? Um, there's another study about burnout when it comes to um, pediatricians. And a lot of your departments were actually taking care of adults during COVID, no, doctor? We sure were. Um, it's only recently that we have stopped. So, you know, I think burnout is real. Um, my department is very close. Uh, we have a lot of resources for us available to combat burnout. You know, we all sort of banded together and went through this together. Um, and, you know, we, we did the best that we could. There were people ultimately who had it much worse than we did. And, you know, as a team, we kept each other going. But it definitely has been a long year and a half. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for your time today. We're always happy to have you and other Montefiore specialists on our program. Thank you for your work in our community. Thank you for having me. Again, Dr. Rachel Levine is a fellow at the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at CHAM Montefiore. We'll be right back here on OpenBXRX Tuesday.